Well, I'm uh, Brendan Fellingham, the historian for the Avapai County Sheriff's Office. And this is the first in the series of uh, oral interviews that I'm going to do with various retirees and so forth of the Sheriff's Office. And here with me, I have one of our retired uh, lieutenants with us. Yes, I'm, I'm Wes Malden, and I did retire. I uh, actually retired first time from DPS and, and uh, then came to work for the Yapai County Sheriff's Office and retired from there. So I am the retiree. And if you would tell me a little bit, where were you born in Oklahoma and, you know, uh, what life was like there? What, who were your parents? Did you have brothers and sisters? Uh, Okay, I was born in a little town called Central Homa, Oklahoma, which if I understand it right, is right there in the, uh, around the Oklahoma-Texas line. And my parents left Oklahoma when I was just a baby, so I don't remember anything about it. And uh, uh, if you've ever seen the movie Grapes of Wrath, that probably uh, <laughs> represented my family oh, really? because of the Depression. That was I was born right in the middle of the Depression, 1930. And uh, uh, I do remember that we were in California for a year or so, and then I came back and I basically grew up in Phoenix. That's where I went to school, and, and uh, I always considered Phoenix to be my hometown. Were your parents uh, farmers? My, my dad was a farmer. He did work for the railroad at one time, and, uh, but mostly he was a farmer. And uh, I grew up on a farm, basically. And uh, so uh, uh, I did I have, uh, or did have, all of my brothers and sisters except one uh, is gone. I had uh, six brothers and sisters, two brothers and, and, and four sisters. Uh, I have one surviving sister. She's in a nursing home in Camp Verde. She's 96 years old in a nursing home. And her and I are the only two members of the family that are left. And, uh, as a young boy and a young man during World War II, uh, I remember having to pick cotton, and I always hated that because there wasn't anybody around uh, to do it. Other. Well, as a matter of fact, there was too. There's German prisoners of war mm -hmm. uh, that worked on farms back in the, those days. And one of the jobs I had, and I remember this, and I was 14 years old, I had a, a 30 German prisoners of war that I was overseeing and uh, weighing their cotton for them as they waited in and dumped it. But that was that was one of the jobs that that I had as a as a kid. And uh so that was quite an experience. And did you did you go to school there in Phoenix? Went to school, yeah. Would you tell us about that? Some of your teachers and some of your friends there in school? You know, I I, I don't recall all my teachers' names. I remember one Griffin named Miss Miss Griffin. But I went to Roosevelt Grade School. And I remember we did not have any air conditioning at all, uh, but there was an irrigation ditch and a big cottonwood tree that was off to the east of the school there on the east side of the school. And we used to go out and sit under that tree and have our classes in the yeah. hot summertime. And every now and then we'd fall in the ditch and get cooled off. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, anyway, it's uh, it was quite an experience. And then the old, uh, uh, Phoenix Union High School, and then they had uh, Phoenix Tech, which was directly across the street, and it no longer exists. But Phoenix Tech is where I went to. And uh, you could learn a trade at Phoenix Tech if you wanted to. And uh, that was the high school. What was your favorite subject in school? Probably history. I like that better than anything else. And. Uh, I, I I always enjoyed school. Really, I think is overall, and uh, uh, I kind of maybe because of when I went to school, I wouldn't didn't have to work in the fields, so that oh, okay. that made me enjoy school even more. I think, <laughs> and uh, but uh, uh, I just I never dreaded going to school like some kids I knew did, and and uh, it was always just kind of a pleasure for me to go. How far did you get in school? I went to my first year, well, high school, and then I left school and I went in the Navy and I went, I got a, my diploma through, a, well, what do they call it? Correspondence or? Yeah, 
not correspondence. It was a a program they had where you could take a test, and and uh, I got my high school diploma through them. And after I got out of the Navy, I went to to college, night school, for, and uh, all I lack in having a degree from college is English. And I knew I'd fail, so I didn't take it. <laughs> but uh, I. Uh, uh, I could get a degree very easily if I just go ahead and take the few hours I'd have to take English. Well, now before you left <clears throat> to go to the Navy, tell me a little bit about um, what life was like for you. Uh, you know, in Phoenix, where where was your house? Was there some? You know? uh, we lived on. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Phoenix or not, but a, on a street called Watkins Road. Watkins Road was just south of the airport, between Sky Harbor Airport and, and the river, Salt River. Um, we had a good life there, really, and uh, uh, that was where I was living when I went in the Arizona National Guard. And uh, so, uh, I, you know, it's just, I guess, a normal, what you'd call a normal life, except we slept in the yard in the summertime. Did you uh, did you meet your wife before, or your future wife before you left for the Navy? Yes, I did. And the story behind that is my wife was married to my brother. Oh. And uh, I first met her, to answer your first question, I first met my wife probably when I was 16, I think. And my, my older brother was in the Navy and, and during World War II he got out of the Navy and Make a long story short, when I went to the Navy, he and my wife were married. And then two months before my time was up in the Navy, my brother was killed in a mining accident up in Superior. And, uh, or Ray, rather. And uh, one thing led to another when I got out of the Navy and, and uh, my wife and I got married. We've been married 63 years. So, and, uh, but uh, we have... We had two children, my wife and I, two, two children, and my brother and her had two children. Oh, really? So there was four. But my daughter was in a wheelchair all of her life. She died five years ago. Uh, she was the only girl, and we had three sons. And uh, so in a nutshell, that's the story of that life. But I didn't know her before I went in the Navy, and I knew her before she married my brother. And... Uh, but uh, when I got out of the Navy, she had the two small, just babies, two children. And I felt an obligation to take care of my brother's kids. And one thing led to another, and we were married. And been married for, like I say, the past 60 for years. <clears throat> well, so um, you left the Navy after a few years. Uh, you decided you didn't want to make that a career? You know, I had planned on going back into the Navy. But when my wife and I got married, those plans changed. <laughs> and, and so, yeah, I had planned on making it a career, but it didn't work out that way. And so law enforcement was my second choice, I guess. And, and uh, although they called the Korean War a law enforcement a Police thing. action. Yeah, <laughs> police action, yeah. I think Harry Truman said that. Yeah, he did. And uh, so... Uh, but that's one of the reasons that I left the Navy was my brother was killed and there was the two small children that needed, you know, needed somebody to watch after them and their, my wife and I'd known her from several years and and so we were married and that's the story of us living in, in the Verde Valley right now. She was from Missouri, my wife is from Missouri and her folks had moved to uh, right down the street from where we lived on Watkins Road when I was still living there. Well, um, what were the circumstances that your brother was killed? He was a shovel, a oiler on a shovel in the mines in the Ray. And one of the trucks came down, one of the big trucks that hauled the ore, came down and was approaching the, the rig that he worked on. And there was an overhead line and this truck had failed to lower its bed, the uh, dump bed, and that caught that line, broke it, and it fell into a, a barrel of oil 
that my brother was standing by. And the oil splashed all over him that left, set him on fire, burned oh. him to death. Yeah. So, and uh, so uh, anyway, that's I, I, that's the way I was, it was explained to me that it happened. And, and, uh, what do you you know what year that was? That was 1952 as well. I I was just about out to, to do in my re enlistment in the Navy when that happened. Well, so what do you recall? What year you you joined the Navy? 1952. No, no, I'm sorry, 1948, and I got out in 52. So what were your uh, your duties and so forth in the Navy? Uh, San Diego, and I uh, went through boot camp there, and uh, I was Navy Air, what they call uh, air deal. You can see the, air, the aircraft we were flying, up those. I wasn't a pilot, but I flew as an air crewman at, at times. I was in aviation electronics, and... Uh, we were, we were flying drone aircraft back in those days, that, really? and that was secret, kind of a secret type thing at that time. But there's a picture of some of the drones we flew. We flew full-size, prop-driven aircraft, drones, but the only difference in the drones we flew at that time and the ones now is we had to keep in sight of the one. If we were flying a drone, we had to have him in sight to control him or control it. And uh, it was kind of a... Kind of a half secret thing. You had to have a secret clearance to get there and all that. But were yeah. you uh, were the drones flying off ships or from land based? We uh, uh, one time we did fly off the Essex, the aircraft carrier. Uh, took off with no problem, but had a problem in trying to land it on the flight deck. So the captain took us in and kicked us off and said, "Never get aboard his ship again." And that was it. So we never flew them off our ships after that. What was the uh, uh, drone program's uh, mission at that time? Uh, the basic mission was for gunnery practice, for the Navy, the fleet, Pacific Fleet. We did fly some missions over Korea that were kind of secret stuff that we were doing, and and uh, we had to sign a thing at that particular time saying we'd never talk about it. And so I'm, I. I can tell you about it, but if I told you about it, I couldn't let you leave my house. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, it, it was it was primarily we we were used for gunnery practice and shoot our aircraft down. Well, so you went into law enforcement then after you got out of the Navy. What uh, what got you interested in that and wanted to make that a career choice? I you know I uh, I think that experience that we had in the National Guard before I went uh, in the Navy. Uh, that certainly got me thinking about it, and uh, I didn't go into I didn't go with the Phoenix Police Department until 1955. However, so it was that time when I got out 52, 53, 54, and I worked as a, a tile setter in that sp space of time. But I, I always had in the back of my mind, well, I'm going to become a police officer one of these days, and uh, uh, when. Uh, and at the time uh, that I got out of the Navy, we lived outside the city limits of Phoenix, and in order to be a Phoenix police officer, you had to live within the city limits. That was a requirement. So in 1955, it turned out that they annexed some things, and I lived in the city limits. I took the exam, and here I am today. Well, so you, when you went in to take the, um, the exam, you know, and then I imagine you went to a police academy, who are the some of the people there that you remember um, in the Phoenix Police Department around that time when you went in there? Well, the, the, the police chief was a man named Charlie Thomas, and he was uh, recognized, I guess, as one of, kind of like Joe Arpaio is today, recognized as one of the toughest police chiefs in the country. Uh, he had, uh, uh, as far as I'm uh, uh, he had a really good department, I think. Uh, you know, he had some very stringent rules. We couldn't do certain things and certain things we, we were expected to do. Uh, he, uh, uh, one of the officers that I worked with and became very good friends with was Gordon Selby, and I don't know if you, you might remember that name. 
but Gordon is an individual who during his time on the Phoenix Police Department, he retired from Phoenix, he was involved in 14 different shooting situations yeah. and he killed 14 people. You didn't screw around with Gordon Selby and uh, that's the long and short of it, you know. But uh, it wasn't that he wasn't, you know, he was in situations where he was justified in doing what he did. But uh, other officers perhaps that was in the same situation might have done it differently, you know. And, uh, uh, but I recall some bad officers. There were some there that were bad, but for the most part, they had really good officers on the Phoenix Police Department. And the, the, uh, without sounding, sounding like I'm bragging or anything like that, when you took the exam for the Phoenix Police Department, they were only taking about eight or nine out of a hundred people that took the exam, eight or nine would pass. Had a real stringent uh, oral board that you went through. Uh, and uh, it was it was kind of a difficult test to take. Uh, we took a written test, an oral exam, and a polygraph examination. And uh, so uh, that's basically. And then we did go to the police academy. Went uh, six weeks, no, eight weeks to the police academy. And where was that located? It was down in South Mountain, right outside Phoenix. And as far as I know, they probably still have the academy out there today. Well, so what, uh, tell me a little bit about how was, what was the atmosphere of the Phoenix Police Department back then? I imagine, you know, I, I'm recalling pictures of old cars, Buick Supers and yeah. single red lights, and, you <laughs> yeah. know. Uh, the, uh, we had, the, my first police car was a 1952 Dodge, okay? which was, had a top speed of maybe 45 miles an hour. And the kids would go by and laugh at you and throw, flip you off and have a good time, you know. And then we got some 55 Chevys with a standard stick in them. You could hit 100 miles an hour in about two seconds and one of them. The kids didn't laugh at us anymore. <laughs> so, but at that particular time, there wasn't that much major crime occurring in Phoenix. Uh, they did have, you know, they did have a homicide or two every now and then, and and uh, I was there. Uh, I was with the Phoenix Police Department for nine years before we ever had a police-involved shooting, and that included Gordon Selby shootings. He took, All right. you know, but uh, now I think they have one every day at least, and uh, so it was. It was a different atmosphere at that time. Uh, I walked a beat in downtown when I was a rookie police officer. I walked a beat, and uh, we didn't. We had walkie-talkies, but they were, they were the size and weight of a car battery. You about that, so we didn't carry them with us. Uh, our only communications was if if for one reason or another the headquarters needed to get in touch with the walking beat, they would turn a light on on top of the radio mast, and we had to keep watching that. And if we saw that light come on. Then we went to a telephone and called in, or we walked into the office. And I always considered it to be one step above smoke signal. Yeah, and uh, it's totally different now. I, in fact, I don't even know if they have a walking beat now or not. I, I don't but, know. Uh, anyway, I was I was very fortunate. I was there, I think, about two and a half years in uniform, and they transferred me to the detective division. And I was... Uh, I made sergeant after three and a half years, and I was primarily the rest of my career was with the detective division. Well, so what what kind of uh, what type of crimes were occurring in those days? Well, we had a lot of armed robberies. In fact, I was the sergeant in charge of the robbery detail, and uh, a lot of burglaries, uh, home break-ins. Uh, had a, we had some assaults, and, and every now and then we would have a homicide, but not that often, and uh, not like it is now. And uh, so uh, it, it was not it was not a bad place to work, it's, you know. And uh, I did uh, while I was there as well. They did, I was there. Uh, 
like I say, in the, in the detective bureau for most of my career, but right before I left the Phoenix Police Department, they, myself and another sergeant, they wanted to form uh, what is now called SWAT teams. And we called it a tactical team at that time. And so myself and another sergeant was in charge of that first tactical team for, uh, for the Phoenix PD. And, the, and uh, we had, uh, I think, 32 officers that was made up that, and we would respond to major crime or if they, they were having some riots at that time too, down on about the Vietnam War. What year was that? And uh, that would have been in 1962 or three, along in there somewhere. And uh, anyway, we, we would respond to the, when the rioters got out of control and things like that. We never had a shooting while I was there in that SWAT team thing, but, but there, in fact, we weren't called SWAT, we were called tactical team. And, uh, but that's what it was all about. And so it was just in the process, I think, of organizing now to where they're at, where they're at now. So, and uh, uh, my wife will get that hopefully. And, uh, but anyway, it, uh, it's changed considerably and it's been a long time since I've been to the Phoenix PD. But one of these days I'd like to attend. I don't know if I ever will get to. They have a museum there now. And uh, I'd like to see that museum and see what it's about. Well, so when you were on the Phoenix Police Department, what uh, what cases do you remember that kind of stand out in your memory that you investigated or, or around at the time that they were being investigated? Well, there's several of them. Uh, the, the Green Bombs, I don't know if you ever heard of that. The Green Bombs is a triple or double homicide. It was a mafia hit and it involved Barry Goldwater. What year was that? Uh, let's see, that probably would have been in 59, somewhere, 58, 59. Uh, we never could charge uh, Goldwater, but he was involved to a certain extent in it, and it was a mafia hit, no question about it. Uh, Miranda, I was a night supervisor and at uh, the detective bureau the night that he was brought in there, I sat in on the interrogation of Miranda. So what was that. what were this what was the situation that Miranda was arrested in the first place? He was uh, he he had assaulted two or three women, sexually assaulted them. He was also a burglar, and involved in some other things, just thefts, and he just overall he he was just a crook, <laughs> and then, but uh, that comes to mind the Miranda the one, one does. I remember I recall another case that I worked that was a. 17-year-old boy, uh, a homicide case. He was a suspect, and he had uh, taken the life of a woman who I think she was 88 or 89 years old, and he mutilated her body after he did that. It's the first mutilation murder I ever worked for. He cut her up, cut crosses on her belly, and did all kinds of things that uh, you wouldn't think a 17-year-old would do. But, and uh, So that's some of the things I recall. Well, if you would, tell me a little bit more about Miranda and how that situation unfolded and what sort of, what were some of the historical, you know, ramifications that came about because of that. Uh, Miranda, like I say, I was a nighttime supervisor when he was arrested and uh, I think a detective by the name of Carol Cooley and Dick Golden are the two that arrested him. And they brought him into the station and we, uh, at that time, the detective bureau had interrogation rooms that were set up with uh, uh, everything you needed for an interrogation. We didn't have to advise them that they needed an attorney or had the right to an attorney. And just a routine type interrogation about what he'd been up to. And uh, if I recall correctly, he did admit to some of the things that we suspected him of. Uh, it's been a long time and I can't recall all all the details, but it was just, we gave him coffee, let him smoke a cigarette, you know, didn't mistreat him in any way. And we were rather surprised when he, the Miranda decision came out, I think everybody was, that it sounded like he'd been totally mistreated and, and uh, he was not mistreated at all. I do remember that his girlfriend, and I think her name was Hoffman, Twyla Hoffman, I believe. She had a funny name, Twyla. And she 
gave some information on him, but not that night, but later on she gave in some information on him. So, uh, But that's about all I recall about it, just routine type interrogation. You Had do. you ever encountered Miranda uh, personally while you were working? Uh, you know, I think I have, but I can't recall exactly where or when. Uh, we we at that time, like I say, you, you know, the word would get around if you had a crook like that that was doing a lot of things. His name would come up, and you'd kind of keep your eye out for him. But and I I didn't I think I probably did, but I can't say for sure. And, but did you end up uh, knowing? Um, uh, Bob Scott, when he was working the Phoenix Police Department. Yeah, he later came, became. You're talking about Scott, that was yeah. a sergeant with it. Yeah, 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 I knew him. Yeah, sure did. And uh, he worked. Uh, he's working the West Side. I know over around 19th Avenue and McDowell. One time, I remember him and I had a involved in a shooting over there for a fellow shot his wife as she sat at the bar. And he shot her and took his rifle and walked up to the door and run the barrel through the door and shot her right between the eyes, if I remember right. And uh, that's a long time ago, too. And uh, Well, uh, are there any unsolved cases that you can recall that are still open there from Well, Phoenix? the unsolved one, and, 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 and actually we solved it, but couldn't couldn't get enough to prosecute it was that green bomb case I was telling you about the mafia hit and uh, uh, even though Goldwater was involved in it and we know that he was and he didn't deny it really but it not enough to prosecute him for it but the actual hit man we've never identified him well how did you believe Goldwater may have been involved he was involved with them with green bombs in a deal in Las Vegas uh, uh, Green Bombs was, they were shady type people too. And they were all involved in a casino up in Vegas. And the Green Bombs had, had somehow or another got to go water in it and he had a lot of animosity towards the Green Bombs. And, and uh, you know, I'm sure if, if he was still alive today and you talked to him, he'd say, I didn't even know the people. But I'm here to tell you, that in my mind, I know that he did know him, and I know he had a part in it, but I couldn't prove it. So it's, it's one of those type of things. And uh, I don't recall, you know, there's I, there's a lot of burglaries and armed robberies that, uh, that probably were never solved and and uh, things like that. But uh, we had a, we had a pretty good clearance rate. And uh, like I say, I was. I was in charge of the robbery detail in Phoenix, and then I had the uh, what they call crimes against property. I was in charge of that at one time, and then the, the tactical squad, which was a plain clothes uniform type situation, whenever needed, and uh, in 1962 I was selected as the officer of the year for Phoenix. Uh, and yeah, that was '62. So overall, I, I had a I had a good career at, at Phoenix PD while I was there. I, I, like I say, I made detective after about two years, two and a half years maybe, and then was officer of the year, and then made sergeant in that particular time. Did you have a uh, particular partner that you worked with, or a series of partners? Uh, Gordon Selby, the man I mentioned, he was my partner for a while, and that's basically the, the, the you know, I, I had partners in several different cases I worked, it'd be different ones there, but Gordon and I were the two that worked together more than anything else. And uh, he, uh, he died recently, up, he lived in Payson, but uh, uh, He's the only one I remember that we actually were partners for any period of time and on any particular case we worked together, you know. Well now this, uh, this time in your life was the first time you'd got into investigations. Um, is there one or several things that you had picked up while you were a detective the first several years 
that really stuck with you all over your next quite a few years in investigations? No, I, you know, I don't know. Uh, it's just the way that things worked out for me over the years. And, and when, uh, as a matter of fact, I was on vacation in Missouri and I got a call when I transferred to the state, they called me and said, hey, do you, would you take a transfer to state service? And uh, because they, you know, they indicted a lot of these officers and for theft and a bunch of other things. And This was on the highway patrol, DPS? No, that was when it was still liquor and narcotics investigations. Oh, okay. And uh, so anyway, that, and I think that call was made to me because I had made officer of the year and had done some other things. And I don't know that that's why it was made. The governor's office called me and uh, asked me if I would be interested in that job. And they said, you know, there's no hurry. I'm on va I told them I'm on vacation. They said, well, there's no hurry. Just think it over and let us know when you get back. And I walked in my house in Phoenix, coming back from that vacation, my phone was ringing. I picked it up and there's the governor's office and they said, we got to have your answer right now. There's no more time. <laughs> so I said, okay, I'll take it. And uh, so they, that's when I transferred to the state and they sent me to Tucson, the Tucson office, because all the officers in the Tucson office had been indicted except two of them. Do you recall what the situation was that they were indicted and all? Because I imagine this was a pretty big scandal. They, they at the were time. Uh, at that particular time. You could use your. They were using their private vehicles, and they were getting mileage for it. And so the big thing was that a lot of times they're, they they'd never even go to work, and they'd say, "Well, I drove 300 miles tonight," and get I forget how many cents a, a mile they were getting, but and they jacked their cars up and and on jacks and run the mileage up on them and uh, doing all kinds of, and, they, and some of them were selling and using narcotics. And uh, uh, along with two or three officers on the Tucson Police Department that we made, we busted after I went to Tucson. And it was, uh, uh, it was quite a deal. They were, they were involved in quite a few things. And uh, so, uh, that was my first assignment with the state to go down there and, and they told me go down there and clean that office up, hire you some officers that you trust. And so they let me just give me a free reign to do what I wanted to do. Well, did you ever have conversations with any of these officers that had been relieved of their duties and or terminated as to why they may have done certain things? Or We did talk to a couple of them that was not indicted but that had been there and knew of some things that was going on. They, they wouldn't admit that they did it themselves, but they knew some things were going on and they just didn't tell anybody about it. And, and uh, so, uh, uh, but they were, they had already left, you know, they were no longer working for that department. And uh, uh, it, was, it was quite a, quite a deal really. It involved quite, not only did it involve them, but there was, like I said, there was two or three Tucson police officers that was involved in, with them in the narcotics part of the operation. And one of the narcotics officers in Tucson PD was one of the bigger dealers in Tucson in narcotics. And we busted him uh, after I got down there. Do you, know, do you remember who that individual yeah, His name was, was Bill Dunn. And Bill Dunn, amazingly, was had his time in and they let him retire. And he's drawing retirement if he's still, he's probably dead now. But the chief of police at the time of Tucson was Guy Mar, a guy named Guy, Bernard Guymar. And he was involved to a certain extent. And when we busted Bill Dunn, I hauled him down to Guymar's office and told him, we know all about you. He left and went to the, the chief police left town and went down to Miami, Florida, as far as I know. But uh, no, it was, it was it was a touchy situation for a while. That we had I had in some investigations we were doing, I had rented a room at the Ramada Inn in Tucson, and Tucson found out about that. They they bugged our room. The one that we had rented, we the, were doing a narcotics deal. The Tucson Police Department. Yeah, bugged, bugged our room. room. Yeah, but. The man that they had working for him as an informant 
was my personal informant. He came and told me about it. And we caught him in the act. Wow. And and we got, they were in the room next to the room that I had rented. And we kicked the door in and got them. They were in there listening to what was going on. <laughs> it was, it was a, an exciting time. Well, you know, when you talk about investigating chiefs of police and so forth, um, was that, uh, that was, uh, was the sheriff of Pima County involved in that investigation? We did an investigation on him as well, Walton Burr. And his job, was, his uh, thing with Walton Burr, he was selling jobs. If you wanted a job with his department, you had to buy it. And we were able to get a, an order to wiretap his phone, and we had all kinds of evidence on him. And so he didn't run for re-election. And uh, that's about the only thing we got, got him on was he was selling jobs. But, uh, and he was involved in some other things, but we never could prove it. Uh, Do you think this corruption was expansive uh, across southern Arizona where other sheriffs and Tucson, other Especially chiefs? in Tucson. Because the reason being that Tucson was the home of the mafia and still is. And the Bananos, the Licavolis, the uh, Spinellis, uh, Battaglia, all mafia families from back east that had summer or had winter homes in Tucson. And they were bombing each other. They were, we had all kinds of bombings going on. Uh, and, and there was officers that knew all about this that were part of it, like I say. In fact, one FBI agent was involved. We got him too. Really? And uh, his name was David Hale. And he was involved and trying to start a war between the Licavolis and the Bananos. So he would place bombs in Licavolis uh, business and they'd blame it on Banano. And B Banano would have a house bombed and he'd blame it on Licavoli. And, and we got him on that one. And uh, he'd had to leave too. Do you think he was doing that? Oh, uh, I know he was. Under his own initiative? Yeah. Well. Hoover might have been involved, I don't know. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, I was scheduled to go to the FBI Academy. And because of that involvement of that FBI agent and us exposing him, Hoover wrote a thing on the edge of my application, denied no, no, no FBI Academy for this individual or something like that. But anyway, it was, it was, a, it was a very interesting time. They, were following my kids to school and harassing my wife. And they burglarized, the FBI burglarized our home two different times in Tucson while we were away. Didn't take anything, just threw everything out in the yard. Just so they let me know, you know, we're around, we're watching you. Wow. <laughs> it, was, it, it, it was something else. Well, so now you're this it's the end of the 60s and you're being asked to to come over to the uh, Department of Public Safety until DPS was formed that's all they were was that was the highway patrol and when they absorbed liquor and narcotics and also in addition to that uh, those of us who were already in liquor and, and narcotics section that was taken into the DPS they hired about a hundred other officers off of Phoenix and Tucson in a criminal division so, you know, and uh, it was quite a process getting this all put together. Uh, where we, you know, we still, uh, we had to, like I say, mine was a general criminal investigation section is what I was doing. Uh, there was uh, Gordon Selby, who had been my partner. He was in charge of the liquor and narcotics for the state at that time. So when DPS was formed there in 1969, um, were you a uh, what uh, you were? What were you appointed to? Did you have a rank? I was a captain at that time, and uh, uh, the captains were were uh, either section leaders like I was, or they were zone commanders. If you were a highway patrol, if you're in uniform, you were a zone commander. If you were in, in plain clothes like me, I was a section leader. But, I, but we all had the same rank, we were all captains. It was fun getting started. 
And then a year or so before my retirement, I was, they sent me to Eloy to reorganize that department and do some things down there. And I, they kept me there for a year, even though I was still a DPS officer. I was an acting chief of police in Eloy. And uh, so we reorganized that and got everything up, hired a new chief. Uh, he stayed for a short period of time and left. And the Eloy says, well, won't you come back and do it? And anyway, I was close to my retirement. I said, well, when my day to retire comes along, I'll do it. And so then I left and became chief of police down there. And uh, But uh, I did do, do a little over a year in a uniform with DPS just so I could get some rest. I was, <laughs> I, I, and I was a zone commander, I was Northern Arizona zone commander, a flagstaff in, in Holbrook in uniform. I worked as a uniform zone commander. Now that you, you had come in as a captain and in an effect the, uh, um, the chief investigator for the state, yeah. um, did you find it difficult to, um, you know, when you had to encounter other sheriffs or other state officials to uh, to find support for yourself in this new role in this new agency the times that we were generally called would be uh, when you know the the county or the city that called us didn't have the resources or the finances or to do certain things uh, for instance a lot of homicide investigations and, and major crime investigations that you do require if you're going to do an effective job you may have to travel to Alaska, we never know. And so a lot of these agencies would not have the resources to do things like that. And so they could call on the state DPS and you know maybe work things out where, where they can get a good investigation going. And uh, partly because of that and different agencies that I've worked with, I've, I think I've done investigations in almost every state in the union at one time or another. Except Alaska, I never. I always wanted to go to Alaska. I never did get to go there. But uh, uh, you know, that's that's the type of assistance that the state was offering to these different agencies. So when did you um, leave uh, DPS? I retired from DPS January the first, nineteen seventy-six, and on January first, nineteen seventy-six, I became the permanent chief of Eloy Police Department and stayed there until November of 78, when I came to Verde Valley. Well, now when you get to Eloy, this is your first time as a chief executive. No, or, no. I was acting chief of police in Wilcox oh. before that. <laughs> I forgot about that. Uh, because we had arrested the chief of police down there for assault with a deadly weapon and burglary and and it was on New Year's Eve, and the city council had a, an emergency meeting and appointed me chief of police as an acting chief of police until they could get the thing straightened out. So I was there for probably a month as their acting chief of police. Now, you, you know, you've talked about corruption and arresting these various chiefs of police in your career. What do you think, you know, has caused that, you know, has that been a lack of training? I mean, you, it's obviously individual choices, but... Uh, was there something in the environment, socially or politically, that may have contributed to that, or you know, lack of hard, training? Or? It's hard to say. It's just that people want certain things and they they can't get it other than stealing it or doing whatever they do to get it. And uh, uh, this deal in Wilcox and I hadn't talked about it before, but the chief police there hired a, a black man to burglarize a market and get in the safe. And then in order to cover up his crime, as this black man came out of the market, the chief of police shot him. He intended to kill him, but he didn't. He didn't fatally wound the man. And I was stationed in Tucson then and, and was called to do an investigation on the shooting. And the black man relayed to me what really happened. He was doing it at the, at the behest of the chief of police in Wilcox. Well, make a long story short, we did a little further investigation and it was very obvious that the, the black guy was telling the truth. 
And so we arrested the chief of police. And what year was that? 1972. What's the... Uh... That was New Year's Eve, 1972, that's when it was. New Year's Eve, 1971, it was going to be 72. Well, I, I'm not... I think the sheriff, or may have been the sheriff in 1973 there, was Jimmy Wilson Jimmy in Wilson. Cochise County. Yeah, Jimmy Wilson was sheriff. Yeah. In fact, he was up there when we arrested. We got the warrant. I had to go to, to Bisbee and Superior Court warrant. And we got the warrant for the chief. Jimmy came back with me, and he and I arrested the chief of police in Wilcox. And his name was Mel Wilder. And he eventually got, I think, seven years in prison, and I don't know where he is now. So after um, Eloy, did you did you come to the Yavapai County Sheriff's Office? Yeah, we I came we came moved to the valley. My handicapped daughter, uh, we had her enrolled in in Rainbow Acres, and that's why we came here to, to begin with to get her taken care of. And and we built I took time built my home in in Camp Verde. Uh, Went to work for, uh, after I got the home built, I did, built a house myself, and after I got that done, and I went to work as a, a manager or, or assistant manager of the Fairway Market in Camp Verde. And believe me, I, I, civilian work didn't work out for me. I worked there for about two or three months, and Curly came over, or I saw him somewhere, and I asked him if he's hiring anybody, and he said, yeah, and so I said, well, you know, I'm putting in an application. And this is Curly Moore, the sheriff for yeah. Yavapai County at yeah. that time? Yeah, and of course I knew Curly for a long time before that, and and uh, so he hired me and and uh, as an investigator, and so I worked as an investigator and, for the, the and uh, yeah. was promoted to sergeant and then lieutenant. So, what are some of your uh, memories uh, of of your time in the sheriff's office? Well, I worked a couple of homicides. That, uh, I remember one that uh, we worked in. The homicide occurred over here on Interstate 17, and we found a uh, at the scene. We found an avocado, found the body and an avocado. That's all we found, and uh, also found some tracks that indicated a truck had been there. Uh, dual dual to wheels. Anyway, we put out a. a teletype to all police agencies that we were looking for a possible homicide suspect that would be driving a truck. We didn't know what kind, but it might have had avocados aboard. <laughs> and believe it or not, we got a teletype back from Albuquerque, New Mexico. Really? Said we have a U-Haul truck here that has blood in it on the seat. It's got avocados in the back, and we don't know where the driver is. And so anyway, make a long story short, we followed up on that and found out that the driver, uh, I forget now exactly how I found out, but that he had went on to Oklahoma. Really? So we tailed him down to Hobart, Oklahoma, and got a hold of the sheriff there, and the sheriff knew the guy by name. He said, oh yeah, I've known his family all my life, and he just got back from California, and and been driving a truck out there, and and anyway, it turned out to be our man. And so I, I, that's one I recall. Then we had another one, that, another homicide that occurred over here, near Sedona, but it was a narcotic trip-off type thing. We worked that one. So in 1984, um, what made you decide to run for the uh, board of supervisors? I was asked by several people to do it, to run for the office. And so, I, you know, I, I really didn't, uh, <laughs> I didn't need a job. I had a job, didn't, I really didn't even need the job I had. As a, the, my retirement's treated me very good over the years. I could live off of that. And, and so I said, well, I'll just be a politician for a while and try it and see. And so I ran for the office and was elected and did my four years. and. And uh, then the next time up, I run for re-election, and uh, the greatest thing that ever happened to me, I was defeated. <laughs> and uh, uh, so uh, that was not a job. That job 
was where half the people of this district loved me at any given time, and the other half totally hated me. So in your four years on the board, what situations or issues uh, came before you? And uh, your other board members, uh, John Olson. Yeah, John Olson and, and uh, uh, what's her name, Gladys Gardner, were the other two supervisors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, one thing that we did, and it's one thing that I promised when I was elected, I promised to get a building code for Yavapai County. They had no building code before. In fact, when, uh, you know, growing up in Phoenix and having to build a couple of houses down in Phoenix, I knew that they sh should meet certain standards. And when they came up here and my wife and I bought a lot over in Camp Verde and was going to build our own home, no permit required. You just go out there and build it. In fact, I came to the county and, and asked the, one of the guys at the county uh, about a building permit. He said, I don't care. He said, build it out of beer cans if you want to. And so a lot of houses in Yavapai County, and especially in the Verde Valley, I think, don't even have a foundation to them. <coughs> Fortunately, this house does. I wouldn't have bought it if it didn't. But uh, I, that's one thing I promised I would do if they elected me, I would get a building code for Yavapai County. And so we passed a building code, and we now have a uniform building code applies to Yavapai County. And you can't build a shoddy house out here and get by with it. What, what so I'm proud of that. That's yeah. one thing I did I'm proud of. Uh, we paved a few streets that needed to be paved and did a few other things, I guess, that uh, built uh, the jail here in Camp Verde. Uh, I got the land for that, uh, 30 acres. Uh, I paid for seven and the guy donated the rest of the 30 acres. Here in Camp Verde? Yeah, over where the jail is, there in Camp Verde. And, uh, that was another major project that I had, so I'm kind of proud of that. Well, since you retired, how do you think law enforcement has changed? Well, I think the, the, the big change I see is that every officer now that I know of has his own personal radio that he carries and got his mic on his shoulder. Uh, most of them have computers in the car. Uh, for someone thinking about law enforcement that may be watching this, do you have any words of advice for them? I think that, uh, you know, they, they need to be sure. If, they, if they're, going to, they're thinking law enforcement, they need to think of it as a career, and they need to be sure that they want to do that. Now, I don't know what your experience has been, but my experience has been that I've seen officers graduate from the academy, come in and work maybe two or three hours of a shift and say, hey, this is not for me, and leave. And I've seen that happen several times. And so I think they need to be sure that they want to do what an officer is required to do. And it's not an easy life, as you well know. There's times out here that uh, I've seen grown men bigger than I am and more manly than I am break down and cry like a baby over things that happen out there. Most people don't realize that. And. Uh, uh, you know, there are times come, and, and you, you're well aware of this too, you may have to go in a bar, in a bar fight situation or someplace like that and take a gun away from somebody that's threatening to kill you. And you have a choice. You're either going to get the gun and not kill him or you're going to kill him and get it. You've got to make that decision in about 30 seconds. And that, that's the type of thing that you live with day by day. And, uh, uh, I know uh, over the years I've been very fortunate. I've been shot at several times, but uh, I got stabbed once and uh, at a family fight situation. And so the Lord looked after me. I had an angel sitting on my shoulder. <laughs> and even the stab wounds didn't hurt me that much because I didn't even feel them until I reached in my car to get a microphone to call for an ambulance for another guy that got stabbed real bad and blood was running off my arm. And I thought, boy, you better get been, an ambulance for yourself. <laughs> I thought, boy, that guy really really got cut up bad. I got his blood all over me, and I looked, and it's my blood running down my arm. And uh, anyway, it's that type of thing. And you need to think about that. Now, can you do that? Are you going to be like Gordon Selby, or are you going to shoot everybody that, that you're justified in shooting, which he did? Not all of them, of course, but he shot, one, he shot a lot of them. And uh, most officers will not do that. They'll try to settle it some other way, but it's an individual choice. 
if the law says you're justified in shooting a man and you shoot him, then you, you shouldn't have a problem. I had a, guy, a man in Camp Verde shot at me no further away than you and I. In fact, we were closer than we are. He shot at me with a shotgun in Camp Verde on a dark, rainy night. And the shot went under my arm. And But I had that angel up there that kind of deflected that. And I had a choice. I could legally kill that guy because he's, he fired the first shot. But my, my choice was, I'm not going to kill him. I'm going to take him. And I did. We took him alive. But it's that type of thing that you're faced with. And you never know when that's going to happen. And, and when I was a Phoenix PD, it was common practice for us to get our cars shot up and bullet holes in our cars and all kinds of things where we had, we had been totally justified in shooting somebody. But hey, that's the, way, that's the choice that you have to make. And uh, fortunately, I, uh, over the years, in 43 years, I never, never killed anybody. I felt like it a couple of times, but, <laughs> but didn't do it. But uh, no, the Lord was good to me over the years. And uh, there was a lot of times that I thought maybe I'm going to have to, but didn't do it. So my advice would be to any young person who's thinking of law enforcement as a career is to give a lot of thought about situations like that. And you don't, you don't run into them every day, but uh, you may go f for a month and life is a breeze and you're enjoying good health and all that, and then all of a sudden you walk in the door of a bar and there's a man standing there with a sawed-off shotgun. What are you going to do? You got you got to make that choice right there. And uh, anyway, that would be my advice to him. Think it over. Be real careful. And it's been good to me. And I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying, you know, make sure that's what you want to do. Well, I sure appreciate your time this afternoon. Oh, not a problem. It was good talking to you. Well, thank it you very back much. back some old memories. <laughs> <laughs> some of them I don't want, to, don't want to remember, but it does. No. But no, that's, that's great. I appreciate it.